the whole thing begins with with them arriving in different ways um, without going blow by blow. One of the nice things about the pool is that you are constantly rolling in reference to what somebody just says. And they say, I do this. Very often, uh, you can say, all right, you know, we did, that's a roll. Because a roll has success or failure. You don't roll when something, you know, has boring failure. You, you roll when you say, okay, or else, good. Let's roll. And in this case, because some of the characters are, you know, sneaking in and stuff like that, there's plenty of or else. So we do this. Uh, you also can, so I can call for rolls. I'm saying, well, you know, descending badness is happening, so you're going to roll. And another time the player says, well, I'm doing this or that. And you say, oh, well, that calls for a roll. So you just kind of be alert to the rolls arriving in both directions. And the players quickly picked up the, the dynamic of the, the diagram. And sometimes, let's see, interesting things about the pools to begin with. Sissy actually spent all of her dice. So she spent most of the game with either no dice in her pool or very few dice in her pool. And she often used them right away, um, gambling them, and in at least one case, losing them again. So she ended up, I mean, what they call flailing around in the bottom of the pool, the thing everyone is terrified of. Oh no, what if my pool is empty? No big deal. It's perfectly perfectly viable to play that way. You're not going to uh, do too well outside of your traits. As as I am, I am most stingy as a pool GM. I can give you up from zero to three dice um, when, a, when, a, when a roll is called for. Um, and I am terribly stingy. It's, it's not likely that you're going to be getting three dice from me unless it's one of these knockout moments of, you know, the, the, the tableau in the background and what you're doing and your position of advantage and what you're saying as you do it and your tactic in doing it. I mean, unless you've got like this huge lineup on that stuff, you ain't getting three dice from me. So therefore, uh, Sissy stuck real close to Aiden's traits when she wanted to get stuff done and Aiden had some pretty cool traits. It's a way to play the pool to be pretty poolless, and that's all right. Uh, the other two sort of really enjoyed, you know, bulking a pool, a pool and gambling a lot. And we, of course, had at least one golden moment where, you know, a huge handful of dice hit the table and no ones appeared. And it's like, ah, oh, you know, so that's great. Um, they quickly flashed on the difference between taking the new die to the pool or going for the monologue of victory quickly realized that I was, as I explained, when I narrate success for a character, I do it very simply. It's vanilla. That's, that's given for playing the pool is that if the GM narrates success, then they get what that conflict had in it. And that's that there's no bennies, no context um, that when the player narrates that's exactly what they get to do there is no adding on you don't as i continually say no you cannot you know roll to successfully unmask the killer clown uh or or attempt to get someone to admit that they're the killer clown and you know roll all your dice and you get this success and you say i'm taking the monologue of victory and you say admit you're the killer clown and so the guy says he admits he's the killer clown that's not a monologue of victory you're adding content in the pool what it means is you get more than just what you asked for uh, what you were going for in the conflict there's context there's things about it there's new opportunities there's new things open up and uh, perhaps just the way you describe it and the immediate effects are exactly the way you want them. Uh, you would, for example, be able to get the guy to to say whether they are the killer clown or not successfully, but whether they are or aren't the killer clown, that's the GM would tell you that. So therefore, uh, we continue. They quickly picked up on the, all that and everybody chose to either take a die or to take the monologue very intuitively and in the moment and very effectively so we got to watch the pools wax and wane and we got to watch people consider consider well you know i'm i'm running on my traits alone or i'm i've got 
leeway to do funky things because I've got more dice to gamble in if I want to. So all that was was fine. Um, how events of play proceeded are quite important because if I was just tap dancing in front of them to quote get them all to the well at the same time and that would be a very familiar way of play I don't really like doing that with a pool because it's unnecessary. The pool responds very nicely to, okay, what just happened? So now what are we going to roll about? And that's, I focused on that. Uh, ending up all together at the pool is something that happened, but it really wasn't any, there wasn't any need of me to massage situations to make that easier. And uh, the, the, the showdown situation, if, you want to call it that was extremely enjoyable uh first of all the notion that um that Myrdon wasn't really actually all that thrilled about having an admirer show up and say that they would save them from the sorceress because they love him uh Myrdon is a deeply unself-loving individual and just finds that to be crazy talk and uh so to make a interesting Long story short, as the sorceress is drawing the arcane, the powers of the arcane thing of the well into herself, um, as um, Myrdon is uh, attempting actually to escape back to the sorceress um, ahead of his you know, suspiciously unwanted love interest, as uh, Aiden is attempting to convince him to stay and you know give him a big hug, um, as uh, as as Carwin is thinking, wow, this sorceress might actually be exactly who I need to get out from under the thumb of my 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 sorceress, you know, or, or rather, this sorcerer, might, this get confused, this sorceress might be exactly who I need to help me against my nemesis sorcerer that I want my revenge against. You know, this is what I've been looking for. I can get in on, on her game and this is great. So he's jumping into the portal to try to, you know, to, to see if he can uh, follow up on that. Well, all the roles go every which way. Uh, and people were asking from the beginning, what if we're all doing stuff at once? And what if they're opposed? And what if they're this and that? And I said, don't worry, the logic is sound especially given the interesting outcome of different people choosing monologues of victory with their specific results. We'll just pay attention to what each role really is about. Keep your monologues focused on that if you choose to take monologues, and it'll work out. There's never an incompatible result when you attend to this, trust me. They were like, okay. So this was the chance to see that in action. And sure enough, it all just fell out like a crazy carpet of consequence. Um, and the fun part, of course, is much to everybody's surprise, Carwin failed this monstrous role to hop through the portal and get to the sorceress as a, hey there, you know, count me in. Uh, and instead was... Uh, well, we'll hold off on Carwin because the other result was that Myrdon did get back to, you know, sadly went back to his dysfunctional relationship with the sorceress. And you can see this coming. Aiden, who was trying to hold him back, fails and is necessarily sucked in with him. So now both of them are back with the sorceress. Carwin, having failed, the only one who really, like, sincerely wanted to get back in some not screwed up way. Uh, wanted to get to the sorceress, is the one who failed, and no surprise, but the end of the session comes when, you know, the, the long-nailed hand of Carr falls upon his shoulder from behind, and because Carr, of course, had been lured by this whole situation as well, and has got there too late to suck up the energies, but he has found Carwin, who was trying to get away from him. So anyway, now we have our two sorcerer characters in play, and things are clearly gearing up for some awesome next session, just as this one was extremely enjoyable in the character portraiture and in the series of events that brought us to this pass, which 
I, of course, did not engineer into play. I just played stuff, and they played stuff, and made decisions, and narrated stuff. And we ended up this way. So extraordinarily satisfying. I really hope to hear from some of the others uh, about their thoughts on it. Uh, the pool, when played this way, has such a nice dynamic outcome that people are often absolutely convinced that the GM had been doing intuitive continuity and tap dancing in front of them, massaging events such that they do come to proper rising action and proper climaxes and proper introductions at the right times and stuff like that. And instead, it's really just using the rules and responding and playing with what you know. And I recommend it highly. Oh, yeah. Here's something I need to add, which is easy to forget because it is what you do at the end of a session, but it's so central to playing the pool. At the end, you get to write something new more into your little character saga. And it might amend something. You know, you can change a phrase like uh, instead of saying I love so-and-so, you could say I used to love so-and-so. Or more straightforwardly, you can just put something else on the end and it could be either more about your character, or it could be something related to what just happened, and it, it can include potential traits. So, therefore, although the initial little write-up is a little bit of you know, background, backstory description, what ultimately this becomes is a living document that takes on much more of a saga of play, um, evolving directly out of play, session by session, and of course, as a dice management phenomenon, you can spend pool dice to set up pluses for your traits and vice versa. So there's plenty of room for sort of diminishing traits that you're not that happy with or done with. Uh, there's plenty of room for in, you know, developing new traits or revealing new things about yourself and all sorts of stuff like that. And it's a remarkable device, really. Very, very strong from session to session to session. And I make sure at the end of playing the pool that people know about it and do it. And once they do it, they look at it and they're like, oh, okay, okay, now I'm seeing how all of these mechanisms really roll. And one of them, of course, that I had set up for in the this discussion and presentation already is what Lucas stuck on his, which is that I know that I am Carr, but I refuse to become him. So that's kind of cool. All of a sudden we've got this whole kind of mystic shit. Who knows what going on with Carwin. So awesome, especially because that sets up very nicely for that whole reunion of the two that, that finished the session. Uh, makes me really excited hypothetically, of continuing this should we find ourselves together again. So there you go. There's lots and lots of stuff about the pool at this website. So please rummage and see what you can find and think about what you're seeing. The rules are, you know, beautifully available. I'll grab them. And I want to discuss this in detail. So thank you 